You can just see these two, like, holed up in some back room somewhere, angrily discussing the situation with each other, planning their next move, talking about how terrible Thomas is, you know, whipping each other up into an emotional fury. I mean, what is this? It doesn't really sound like my dad at all. Is there some kind of coup going on? What's happening? Who's taking over my dad's life? I don't know, but it's really crazy. I, I'm, I'm getting really worried. I, I think he's, he's working with some kind of an operator. You know, give me a phone. I'll text him this time. If he's not answering you, he's got to by God answer me. Hi, good morning. How are you? Welcome to another episode of Revenge Review. We're going through Tom Bauer's Revenge is an answer to spare. And this chapter is called Humiliation. It's all about Thomas Markle and those photos that he took right before the wedding that he had intended for them to make him look like he was not a recluse and that he was a man about town and that, you know, he got out and did things and that he was being included in Megan's life. Uh, pictures of Doria and Megan had come out, but as you will recall, Megan was really slow to let Thomas in on her new life. And she kept telling him to lay low and she wouldn't let him come and have photos taken with her. And so the media was speculating, like, what's up with this old fat recluse? You know, is he not part of her life? Is he just this weirdo that lives, you know, in some Mexican village? I mean, because people didn't know much about him, as they will, they were filling in the blanks. Now, fairly early on, in Megan and Harry's relationship, though Harry had never actually met Thomas, he had spoken with him on the phone and they, they texted, it seems like, quite a bit. And he had told Thomas, don't ever engage with the media because they will eat you alive. Um, I wish that Thomas had listened to that advice, but as you're going to see in this chapter, Harry is excessively dramatic when it comes to the media and some of the things that he ends up saying to Thomas are like, what's wrong with you, Harry? Like, you calm down. I mean, just weird, wild, super, like, emotional spikes in all of his communication. And so I almost think that if, if all the communication with Harry at this point had been fueled by these emotional spikes, or had been marked by these emotional spikes, I should say, then I can imagine that he didn't really think it was all that big of a deal if he spoke with the media at all. I also think that Thomas, having been in the industry, not the media, but he had been, on, you know, in the entertainment industry, I think maybe he thought that he was more savvy than he was and that he could figure it out on his own. I think you're going to see, too, um, I don't even want to say that it's a prideful streak. Tom Bauer says that Thomas Markle had a pr prideful streak. And that some of the things he did was as a result of that. I don't disagree with that wholeheartedly. But I, I also think that Megan had not done anything to help him figure out how to handle this kind of weird limbo that he'd found himself in. Because he wasn't able to go live a regular life. But she also was excluding him from her life. So whatever it was that he was living was completely foreign to him. He didn't know how to navigate those waters. He'd reached out consistently for help. He wasn't getting it. And so I think that his reaction... Um, to that was to try to gain back some control and to feel like it was, his, his life wasn't in somebody else's hands, somebody who, quite frankly, didn't seem to care very much about him. So um, we'll just get right into it. So in Rosarito, Thomas Markle was feeling abandoned. I was being chased and harassed on a daily basis by the media. I didn't know who to turn to. The people at the palace gave me no help at all. I felt utterly isolated. Now, Megan had said that if he needed to contact the palace, then he needed to hop on a call with Jason Kanoff. Apparently, she gave him Jason's contact information, and Jason was supposed to keep him apprised of all the things that were going on if and when Megan couldn't be in contact with him. And Megan somehow wasn't able to be in contact with him a lot. So the way he felt was that he had been completely hung out to dry, that he was alone and bombarded and nobody could make it stop but nobody could make it a positive experience either in the sense that he could be willing to deal with the paparazzi if he at least got to have his daughter in his life but why should he live like this i mean these were all the negatives without one positive thrust into the spotlight thomas had become upset about the portrayal of him online and he should have been i mean he did not come off well he looked scruffy obese and they were painting him as some kind of alcoholic hermit 
there were pictures of him coming out of a grocery store and he had four cans of beer and people were like, oh, look at the, look at the old man. He just does nothing but drink all day. Well, I don't know if four cans of beer would mean that, but the trolls on social media and all over the place were berating him. And we have to remember too, that this wasn't exactly a time when people cared about anybody else's story, but Megan's. Right at this point in time, we were really not apprised to the goings on at the palace. We didn't realize that at the palace, they all knew she was completely and totally out of control and a despicable person. We were still being fed the line, and the palace was helping us believe that Megan was the loveliest person you could ever hope to meet. You know, what a philanthropist, what an activist, what a feminist, you know? What a boon that Harry had met some such a wonderful woman. So... It isn't our fault that we didn't realize, but I think in that atmosphere where everybody wanted to make much of Meghan Markle, the opposite of that was to turn against Thomas Markle because it seemed like, why aren't you trying to be part of your daughter's life, man? What's going on? You know, what are you just out there in Mexico drinking and stuff and you can't make time to see your daughter? Nobody could have ever believed that she was aggressively making sure that he stayed in his place and didn't try to come to London. And she had nothing to fear because she knew he couldn't afford to come even if he wanted to. I mean, if he had decided to hop on a plane, I mean, if he had any money at all, that would have really been frightening for her because she couldn't have controlled him. She knew that he was the easiest person in the world to play. And the only reason that she let Doria in, as we've said many a time, is because she wanted Doria to help her with her racial background. What we're going to see in this chapter is the ramping up of the race car playing. And there's going to be people in the palace who predicted that this would happen. Um, They see the way the wind blows and were really disgruntled when they saw Harry and Meghan leaning in on that play constantly. So anyway, here he is. He looks like a mess in the media. Um, It does kind of seem, though, that if you knew the paparazzi was after you all the time and you couldn't go out without being bombarded, that and you were concerned about your appearance, that you would just then make sure that you looked cleaned up when you left the house. I completely understand a couple of those photos at first being just a, you know, regular guy going and doing his regular things. But knowing that people are watching you, it's now incumbent upon you to change your image if you want it to be changed, if you don't want to be a victim to it. So... He felt like he was like he looked like this bum, and then Megan's over there, like the Duchess she's about to become, living this royal lifestyle. And because she was living in such opulence, it made his lifestyle look even worse. And the papers were speculating that Harry hadn't ever met him, speculating correctly. And people were just like, What is going on in this weird little relationship that Megan has with her dad? And again, everyone at that time was Team Markle, so they were putting all the blame on Thomas for not being around. They also kept wondering why, in the media, they continued to question why he kept changing his cell phone number. I don't know how they knew he was changing it, but it's almost like, well, why are you guys wondering why he's changing his cell phone number? You're constantly harassing him. That makes good sense why you change your number, but anyway... At this time, beating up on Thomas Markle in the media was sold papers, and Thomas hated it, and he really wished that he could change it, and he really wished that Meghan would help him in the midst of all this. While he feels like he's being cast out and that nobody cares about him, he happens to have a rare phone call with Meghan. Now remember, she tried to get Jason Knopf to deal with him as much as possible, although it would seem that Jason Knopf wasn't really doing all he could do because Thomas says he never heard a word from the palace. But in a rare phone call with Meghan, Thomas said... And remember, he's planning on going to the wedding, okay? As far as he knows, he's going. He says to Meghan, and to Harry, and specifically to Harry, that he wanted to give a short speech at the wedding reception. That shouldn't be a problem. Why shouldn't he? He's the father of the bride. And shortly after this, Meghan called back to say, Daddy, that's not going to be possible. You can't give a speech at the wedding. The wedding reception, no less. Why would you want to do that? No, we won't be doing that, okay? Mm Mm-mm. And by the way, you guys, can we not recall from Spare when Harry was allowed to speak at William and Catherine's wedding and he gave this long speech about this, about the, about the crazy fans of the wedding and how somebody had sent her an ermine thong that they had fashioned out of some little creatures that they had hunted and killed and he actually had the garment with him? I mean, if anybody should not have been allowed to speak, it should have been Harry. 
And remember, Harry makes this big deal about the fact that he had wanted to give, and I, this wasn't even at the wedding reception. I can't, I'm trying to remember where it was that he gave this speech. It was at a lesser party, I think. And he shouldn't have even been allowed to do that. And he was real sour about it. Knowing what it feels like to be excluded, he should have done something so that Thomas wouldn't have felt so excluded, knowing how that feels. But no, he says to Thomas, you can't, you can't speak. I wish somebody would have told you that, Harry, so you wouldn't have thrown that ermine thong around at the last wedding you were allowed to speak at. Okay, well, anyway, no, Daddy, we're not going to do that. And, of course, Thomas says that hurt, and it was the worst blow. He already feels like he's just being shoved out as quickly and as succinctly as Harry and Meghan can possibly do it. And he's really looking forward to going to the wedding, but it seems like they don't really want him there. I mean, they're they're only bringing him in two days before the wedding starts. They have made him this suit, but he's never tried it on. I mean, it just seems like they're letting him come, but so begrudgingly. And now he wants to give a speech and they won't let him do that either. I mean, it would just be like the most disappointing, depressing event of all time. Well, the award-winning lighting director was a proud man, says Tom Bauer. And he wanted public acknowledgement, even admiration, as the father of this remarkable young woman. Okay. I have two things to say about this. I think Thomas Markle has proven to us that he does not know Megan well or he isn't willing to accept who she's become. He seems like he's buying her public image as well, that she's this amazing, like crazy talented person. But if you ask me, this is some uh, cognitive dissonance because he knows firsthand that she's not an amazing person. She's mean to him all the time and she's been mean to him for years. And it isn't as though this is a new side of Megan that he's never seen. He keeps saying that, he keeps telling Samantha, she's changed. She's a different person. I don't understand. When she's with Harry, she is nice to me. But when Harry leaves the room, she's mean. Exactly. Me thinks Megan speaketh with a forked tongue. Because what is this? And why is he so surprised by her? So I think that he doesn't want to believe he failed as a father. So he wants to believe this public image that she has, even though he knows how that public image was curated. He knows how it works. He worked in Hollywood. But he wants to believe so badly because that makes him feel like he is a success in his life, particularly at a time when he doesn't feel very successful. But the, to want to be linked to this person, to want to get accolades for it, I think really shows his heightening delusions. Because this doesn't, this doesn't even compute with his reality. Does he... Does he just not think everybody's going to find out who she really is? And that he still wants his name linked with somebody who is being perceived as wonderful and just hopefully no one will really know what the truth is? Or does he really think that she's a wonderful person and that it's just been a couple of off times when she's been so mean to him? I don't know. Whatever the reason, he did not like being shoved off to the side. He didn't like feeling like he was out of control of the narrative. And he didn't like feeling like all of his, I guess, work to help Megan get to where she was. And financially, we can all agree that he had helped Megan exceedingly. He didn't like feeling like he wasn't getting any credit for all that. So, Samantha Markle, you guys, I have feelings about Samantha. Samantha Markle tells her dad that she thinks that there is a way for him to turn this all around in his favor. There need be no reason to be shoved off and to be painted in this terrible light. Take control, Dad. Take control, says Samantha. Well, this guy named Jeff Rayner had approached Thomas about taking some pictures of him that would help to curate his own public image. Now, Megan had been over there trying to curate her image for years and years and years. As the day is long, Megan had been working. So why shouldn't Thomas also use the same means that she had her whole life? But suddenly, when Thomas does it, it's terrible. Although, I mean, we'll go on to see that he wasn't working with the uh, best of friends. Jeff Rayner comes, and he is a British photographer based in Los Angeles. Rayner offered to photograph Thomas preparing for the wedding. And Samantha told her father that the photos would show that he was not a recluse. Dad, you don't have to look like a recluse in a big fat slob. Let this Rayner guy help. The media was unfairly making him look bad, she later said, so I suggested he do positive photos for his benefit and that of the royal family. Samantha thought this would be a great plan. 
But so the thing is, is that Samantha hasn't worked with the media. She doesn't know. So how is she to counsel her father appropriately? I mean, I know that she's worked with the media as far as she's told her own story. But I would think that the outlets that want her story and to, you know, splash her gossip all over the pages probably aren't great people anyway. So I don't really know if she should have been counseling her dad here. But she says, you try to take control of the narrative. If we were siblings in the same situation and we saw our dad suffering like this, we would probably try to help him figure out a way to take back some control. Well, that's all Samantha was trying to do. Um, And although in an early phone conversation, Harry had warned Thomas Markle not to deal with the media because they would, quote, eat you alive, Thomas agreed to Samantha's suggestions and didn't heed Harry's warning. Well, I think he thought that how can this go wrong? I'm not doing anything mean or salacious or unkind or gossipy or anything like that. It's just me trying to look less of a mess. So I am so sympathetic to why he wanted to do this. I would have hated everybody acting like I was just this nobody, this big fat nobody living in Nowheresville, drinking my beer all day and ignoring my kid. I mean, what a terrible narrative. Anybody would want to change that around. So against his probably better judgment, he decides to work with Jeff Rayner. Thomas met Rayner at a restaurant in Mexico and Rayner cut... (laughs) He cut right to the point. He says, you look disheveled and fat as he laid out uh, media photos of Thomas. And they looked at them together and there was Thomas carrying his four cans of beer, implying that he was some kind of heavy drinker that just drank himself into a stupor all the live long day. And Rayner says to poor Thomas Markle, who's in a place where he just can't even make good decisions. He says, we're going to make you look great. Anybody who sidles alongside you in your despair who you don't know, and it comes to you with promises of grandeur, let's just make a note to ourselves to tread cautiously. Well, anxious not to appear as if if the photos were staged, Thomas urged that Rayner take some long-distance candid shots. See, and this is where he should have held, held the line on this. I think this could have been pulled off if that's what they had done. If they got Thomas Markle looking cleaned up, well-dressed, combed, brushed, with clothes that fit, doing things that made sense. But what they ended up doing, I, I can't even imagine how Thomas Markle thought these photos were going to turn out well. Because in the process of taking the photos, he should have realized this isn't what we had initially planned on. These are not the long distance candid shots I had asked for. Well, anyway, uh, they signed an agreement. He was only going to be being paid $1,500, but then he was going to get 30% of the royalties. So I guess there's some money there. Now, this is the outcome. On the 27th of March, Rayner photographed staged shots of Markle in Rosarito, glancing through a book of images of Britain at a Starbucks, reading news stories about Meghan and Harry in an internet cafe, and being measured by a tailor for a wedding suit. Now, you guys, the tailor was some 17-year-old that they'd thrown a couple of bucks to, $15, to pretend to be measuring him for a suit. And when Thomas saw these pictures, he was blunt. He's like, these don't look like candid shots to me. And then he chooses to believe this dumb lie. Jeff Rayner says, ah, don't worry. No one will know. Well, how will no one know, Thomas, when you yourself looking at the photos are like, that looks cheesy as hell. I mean, do you you think that there's like some kind of filter they can put over it where it's a completely different photo? What? You knew that these were dumb. So to later play like the victim of, oh, I didn't know it was going to be like this. Well, I think you did know it was going to be like this. Unfortunately, he'd already signed the agreement. So what's he going to do now? He's going to have to cross his fingers and hope that Rainer can make it look decent. But how can he? I mean, though, really? How? These are like up close shots. Okay. Well, the photographer was going to wait until the exact right moment, and then he was going to sell his prize. Meantime, in London, things are not going well at the, at the palace, not surprisingly, with Meghan at the helm. People were already, before the wedding, speculating about the divorce. And one writer, um, Jermaine Greer, who is a Republican feminist, 
came out and she was saying, I think the pressure to escape the firm is crushing. And she said, Megan bolted before. She was out the door. I think she'll bolt. I hope in a way she will bolt, but maybe she'll take Harry with her. People didn't want to lose Harry, but they weren't too sorry to lose her. And fingers crossed she'd just get the hell out of here. They were tired of the Megan story already. The people who knew were just ready to get her away. In this completely prophetic statement, Camilla Long, the a, a columnist, agreed. And she said, I think it's unlikely Megan hasn't already mapped out the big sit-down interview with Megan after the divorce is over and she's fled to America. She's already written her lines about the healing process and will monetize a public personal development. Long was to prove uncannily accurate. As it turns out, Oprah Winfrey had already been to Kensington Palace to discuss an interview before the wedding. Um, flattered that she now ranked among the superstars, that Oprah would be knocking down her door trying to get a story with her. Megan had been told by her palace officials to reject the offer. So she told Oprah that she would wait until the time was right. You guys, I can't wait to get to the Oprah interview chapter. I have so many thoughts about it. So many thoughts. And I'm sure they mirror all of yours as well. But the top of that list is, Oprah, you failed us. That was the worst interview of all time. I've never seen a worse interviewer. She was just over there eating out of Harry and Meghan's hands. Anything Harry and Meghan wanted to feed her, she would have lapped it right up. Take this pill of poison? Okay, I'll take that too. I mean, just fell down on the job in spectacular fashion. I've never seen a less interesting interview. I mean, it was interesting as far as what lies are they going to try to shove down our throats this time? But as far as provocative questions, pushing the narrative, getting some real answers, actual journalism, Oprah was the worst in the world. And I think the thing is, is that it's like, what did we expect? She just wants to keep her celebrity friends by her side as well. She's not really a real journalist anymore. I feel like there was a time when Megan, when, I feel like there was a time when Oprah asked interesting questions. That time has long since passed. But now it's just her, you know, having a little gab fest with her friends anytime she decides to do anything. But I was so disappointed. And the way she just swallowed everything hook, line, and sinker with her, oh, oh my God. You know, it's just like, Oprah, pull yourself together, okay? Pull yourself together. All right, anyway. As people were coming out and speaking openly about the fact that we don't see these people managing to make it any longer than in a couple of years, that triggered other skeptical comments. Was this, asked Patrick Jeffson, uh, Diana's former private secretary, a genuine love story by a woman prepared to sacrifice for duty? Or was she seeking a stage in her lust for fame? I mean, I think we know the answer to that. Of course, that's what she was doing. But I think at the time that he asked that question, it was a much more provocative question. Now it's like, well, of course. I mean, we take it for granted that that's what it was about. But, you know, then he goes on to ask the same question everybody's asking. Does she really understand that she's only famous because of Harry? I mean, how many times can uh, Tom Power report that people are wondering that question? I mean, to Megan, it's like, so what? Fame is fame. She, I don't even, she didn't care that she was famous because of Harry. That had been the point in the first place. And the feminist line that she always uses is only because that's what she thought was going to get her famous then. But if being married will be the thing that makes her famous, she doesn't need to be an independent woman. As mounting criticism began to fall down on Megan, she could no longer ignore the fact that the vibes at the palace weren't great. A close friend described Megan's anger. The critics, she said, were racially motivated. And the friend says, and oh goodness, Find me a woman of color in a senior position who's not been accused of being too angry, too scary, too whatever in the workplace. Please. I'm so sick and tired of that line. If, if Megan had been lily white and been acting like a complete and total out of control bitch, people would have said something about it. It's got nothing to do with the color of the skin. It's how are you treating people? And what would her excuse have been then? She couldn't have just fallen back on this trope of, you just don't like me because... I'm a black woman and I have spicy feelings. Like, that is such a lame stereotype that you would even bother to put yourself in that category of you don't like me because my feelings are, are too interesting for your, for your whiteness. It's just so easy, though, always to say, well, you can't ever understand what my reaction was because our, our skin colors are different. Well, then we'll never, we'll never, never the twain shall meet then, because if I can never understand you and you can never understand me, how can we ever have racial reconciliation? 
That's why I don't understand why people want to live in a world in which you believe that skin color separates indefinitely and eternally. On the eve of the wedding, Patrick Jeffson privately feared that Meghan would use the race card to rebut any unfavorable news stories. It will be really tragic, Jeffson said, if Meghan and her husband got into the habit of firing ethnic warning shots at the very same media they will reliably trumpet all their good work for years to come. Jeffson was also concerned by Harry's conviction that Meghan had much in common with Diana. Jeffson has some really interesting commentary on the whole Meghan is Diana, Diana was Meghan. Because he says, look, Diana and Fergie discovered that they were not indispensable to the success of the royal family. And that Meghan should not overestimate her worth. As a newcomer to the dynasty business, her sole purpose was to preserve the monarchy as the focus of national unity. The Windsors would be ruthless against any threat posed by an aggressor. And of course, he knew Diana much better than Harry had ever known her, as we discussed in the last uh, episode. And Jeffson said that he had seen Diana spread happiness, but he'd also been very familiar with her weaknesses. Working outside the system, Diana ignored advice, kept her officials in the dark, and as a loose cannon beyond anyone's control, was eventually cast out. Megan Jeffson feared was replicating Diana's worst characteristics, not as Harry believed her best characteristics. I think that is so astute, and I think that's exactly what's happening here. Because Harry didn't really know his mom, he only has this idea that Megan is feeding him and that he is willing to believe. And I think he loves this idea that he is with mummy 2.0 and here he can relive uh, his love for his mother uh, with this new woman who is all the things that he has been told his mother was but I don't think that he ever really considered the fact that his mother had been out of control and there certainly were times when she was out of control understandably I think many of us can understand Diana's plight but the reality is she was out of control Okay, so the wedding's counting down. And what should hit the papers? Oh, some photos of Father Marco doing all kinds of weird stagey things in a clear bid to work with photographers to make himself look better. And Kanoff alerted Megan. And she called her father. She asked if he had cooperated with a photographer. I mean, it was pretty obvious he had. Unless the photographer was like just his friend and then his friend stumbled and dropped his phone right into the hands of a newspaper editor and lo and behold there were the photos i mean the fact that thomas thought he could deny having worked with a photographer pretty audacious at megan's request the palace officially denied that thomas markle had cooperated with rayner everyone it was pretty obvious that he had but the palace was also eager to sweep this story under the rug thomas markle said Kanoff was suffering from media intrusion being followed and harassed by photographers, he warned that media to respect Markle's privacy and to stop further harassment. And everyone believed Kanoff's denial. I mean, why shouldn't they? It, the pictures did look kind of stagey and hokey pokey, but at the same time, if the, if the palace is going to say it didn't happen, we'll just go with that. On May 3rd, two weeks before the wedding, Thomas Markle drove to a first aid station with chest pains. Years earlier, he'd received a nitroglycerin treatment for irregular heartbeats, and paramedics told him he was in the midst of a heart attack and he should go immediately to the local hospital. This is the first of several situations having to do with his health. He's not well. I mean, look at the band. Does he look well to you? He goes to the hospital. Uh, after a few hours of poor care and despite suspected congestive heart failure, he discharged himself. He didn't want to stay there, and... I think that he was in denial about how poor his health really was. Over the following days, he told Megan about his health problems. He also told her how much he was looking forward to wearing his new suit and shoes, and that during a trip to Los Angeles, he had left flowers at Doria's house for Mother's Day. So they're in communication. Plans to go to the wedding are still in full swing, as far as he knows. By now, Rayner was selling the photographs across the world, and he was expecting to earn over $100,000. One photo was published by The Sun as an exclusive. Okay, now buckle up, you guys, because this is where Harry decides to just be a complete and total drama queen, and I just cannot even understand what in the world. I mean, 
When I tell you that this man is just completely and totally emotionally regulated, listen to this whopper. I don't know what drugs he was on when he said this. But on May 11th, Harry and Meghan call Thomas Markle, you know, strength together, I guess. And they call him, and during the conversation, they asked if he did cooperate with Rayner. I mean, it just seems so obvious that he had. No, said Thomas. If you're lying to me, said Harry, my children's life will be in danger. What are you talking about? And that's exactly Thomas Markle's reaction. What are you talking about? shouted Thomas, angered by Harry's tirade. You haven't got any children. I mean, <laughs> my children's life will be in danger. What are you even talking? Like, literally, what are you talking about, Harry? Just screaming random things, trying to sound so dramatic, trying to just whip up emotion. My children's life will be in danger. What? This is what I'm talking about when I tell you that Harry is only happy if he's upset or sad. If he's, if he's not one of those things, then he just doesn't feel alive. What are these sentences falling out of his mouth? My children's life are going to be in danger. The kids you don't have? Or the kids you're planning to have with a surrogate? I don't know. Take your pick. On May 11th, Thomas also texted Megan. He says in this text, I know your hard work to make me look good. Thank you. I'm getting excited. It's all so close now, and I can't wait to walk you down the aisle. So Thomas is working to stay in Megan and Harry's good graces. He knows that they're agitated with him. They feel like he's this thing they have to manage, and you can sense that there's embarrassment. It would be really humiliating to feel like your adult daughter found you to be a problem. The Markles' lives permanently changed on Sunday, May 13th. The mail on Sunday exposed Thomas Markle's complicity with Jeff Rayner. A grainy CCTV image recorded outside the Mexican Internet Cafe showed Thomas following Rayner holding a long lensed camera. Other informants, including David Flores the Taylor, confirmed that Thomas Markle had collaborated with Rayner. Well, the palace was understandably incredibly embarrassed. But Megan and Harry were furious about the betrayal. Megan repeated calls to her father were unanswered. Mortified by her inability to tell the palace officials what was happening, she blamed the media as irresponsible, harmful, ruthless, and malevolent. She asserted that the Mail on Sunday had known about the collaboration for some time and had maliciously waited until the last moment to expose her father. But that wasn't true. On May 14th, Thomas woke late as usual around 11 a.m., which was 7 p.m. in London. Thomas texted his daughter that he was sorry about all this. He loved her, and he offered to make a public apology to both her and Prince Harry, and he also said that to spare the family any more embarrassment, he would just not go to the wedding. I think he should not have put that red meat in front of Meghan's nose, but he agreed to bow out. Well, Harry said, don't even with this apology business. Just don't say anything else. We can't trust you to go out and say anything, and that would just make it worse, so don't. And... Thomas said, all right, well, I won't make an apology, but then I will come to the wedding then. If, if you just want to sweep this under the rug and just hopefully move on and not make it continue to be a story in the news, then I won't make the apology. I'll come as normal and we can just progress and hopefully everything will be okay. But then soon after that conversation, Jason Kanoff calls Thomas. Jason says, actually, you do need to apologize. This looked pretty bad and we're going to need you to come out and say you're sorry about it. Trapped in his home in Mexico, Thomas had no one to guide him, no one to help him figure out exactly how to make this apology, and his frustration just began to fester. Nobody seemed to want to take the time to imagine what Thomas's life was like right now. They just kind of wanted to manage him from afar, but nobody was thinking about his humanity and how this would be for him and how he was feeling alone by himself in a little Mexican village, just feeling like he had no one and feeling like his life had completely changed. And like I said at the beginning, what to what benefit had it changed? I think anybody can manage a difficult scenario for a while, for longer than you'd even imagine, if there's some reason for doing it. But he is being shoved to the side and ignored. For what end? It feels like every minute he's losing more and more of his relationship with his daughter. He's not gaining anything by obeying what she says to do. 
Well, Thomas insisted that Kanoff's second call about the apology was his last, and that Kanoff never spoke to him again, and that when he tried to reach out with the number that had been given him, he was never answered and nobody cared. He felt that not only was he abandoned, but now he was utterly humiliated. That lunchtime, he drove to a local McDonald's in Mexico, and then after that meal, he headed to a KFC. So he's eating away his feelings, um, which probably had something to do with the fact that on May 14th, he started having those chest pains again. See, he's not taking care of himself. And this is what I'm saying. I think Thomas is living in a bit of a denial about a lot of things, about the reality of a lot of things. I think it's a lot of time to, by himself, to imagine that things are one way when they're really another. I think he has no one to help him, nobody to bounce ideas off of, nobody to discuss the truth with. I mean, I guess he's got Samantha, but I mean, is Samantha really going to lead him to a, an elevated mindset about any of this? So he starts to have those chest pains again. And it was very similar to that other heart attack that he had. So he asked a friend to drive him across the border to Chula Vista Hospital in California. And while he was waiting, his phone rang. Well, a man called Sarge announced that he was going to be arriving soon to Thomas's house to take him to a Los Angeles airport and that Thomas was going to fly out in two days. Okay, you guys, let's, let, let's look at this timeline. The last time Megan and Harry had a conversation with Thomas, they had told him that everyone was still planning that he'd come to the wedding after they said, you don't have to apologize. Thomas said, okay, I'll come to the wedding anyway. They said, we're going to have somebody come pick you up at your house. Okay. I don't understand why nobody told him when that was going to happen. Like, okay, on this time, at this day, somebody will come pick you up. Anyway, he's in the hospital. He, If he had known when somebody was coming, it seems like he would have called those people and said, hey, I'm going to the hospital. you know. But instead, he gets a phone call uh, from this stranger named Sarge who says, hey, I'm on my way to your house to pick you up. It's like, it seems like it was out of the blue that this person showed up. Also, why is somebody coming to pick him up from his house? to take him to Los Angeles so he can fly out in two days. It doesn't take two days to, to drive from his little place in Mexico to Los Angeles. So what, what's he just going to be hanging out for a couple of days before he flies out? Like that doesn't, what kind of, I don't understand that timeline either. So I don't understand why they couldn't have been like, okay, let's see how things go at the hospital, but you can still make your flight. I mean, it wasn't going to be for like another two days. I do not understand what in the world is happening here. This seems really jacked up and like nobody knew what was going on. It seems wild to me that you'd be in the hospital and then the driver calls you and was like, hey, I'm at your house to come pick you up. And Thomas had no way to let that person know, hey, I'm, I'm going to the hospital. Or even that he, he seemed shocked to have gotten the call in the first place. He seemed to not even know. What, Megan was just like, dad, you have to be ready whenever somebody shows up? What is this? Okay, well, so he says, uh, Sarge calls him and says, I'm coming to your house and to pick you up. Sorry, replied Thomas. I've got to cancel. I, I have to go to the hospital. I'll pass it on, said Sarge. Thank you very much. Before going to the hospital, Thomas spoke to TMZ, an American showbiz website. He confirmed that he had cooperated with Rayner in rehabilitating his image, but he'd been left looking stupid and hammy, and so he wouldn't be flying to London. Contrary to Megan's later claim, he did not personally refuse to go into a waiting car to drive to the airport, nor had he turned away a security guard sent by the British Embassy. Both arrived after Thomas had crossed the border. Before entering the hospital, he texted Megan to apologize and say that he would not travel to London. Okay, so we're getting a lot of weird stories here. I mean, you guys, what kind of drama is this? All right, so there he is, having a heart attack in the hospital. Apparently, before he went in, his... I, Maybe that was his attempt at an apology when he contacted TMZ. Because the first time I read this chapter, I'm like, why is he talking to TMZ? Doesn't he realize that talking to these people was his downfall in the first place? But maybe that was his attempt to get his apology out there. So that's him saying, I, I screwed up. I looked like a fool. I thought I could help myself. I made it worse. And then he says, because of that, he's not flying to London. But he'd already just agreed with... Harry that he would fly so he knows he's going into the hospital was that just him not wanting to give the whole world all of his medical business so he said I'm not flying because I screwed up and so I can't go I'm assuming that the reason he said I can't go is because he was headed to the hospital and he just didn't want to let TMZ know all of his business 
But if he wants to make it look like he and and Megan have a good relationship, it would it's weird that he would not try to make it sound like I messed up, but Megan understands that I was just embarrassed by my image and I'm still really looking forward to going to the wedding. He's actually in the hospital for real, regardless of what Megan wants to think. And the thing to TMZ, appear, apparently that was his apology. Um, but Megan, I mean, I, I can't believe the way she's trying to just to spin things to make her dad look even worse than he did before by later telling everybody, my dad completely abandoned me on my exciting day. He took some stupid pictures and then because he was embarrassed, he wouldn't come. I even sent a car around and he just refused it. But it's like, well, he did refuse it, but he was going to the hospital. So she truly didn't believe he he was there because she she's made up this whole story about how he could have come, but he didn't come. He could not have come. He was having a heart attack and having heart surgery. Okay, well, she wants everyone to think that she has been victimized by her heartless father. Meantime, Harry and Meghan were frantic. In a series of texts to Thomas Markle, the prince was on the edge. It's a really long text. I won't bother to read the whole thing to you because it's just him saying the same thing over and over and over again. But it's just him saying, you know, if you love Meg, you would come. Please make, like, answer our calls. Why won't you pick up? We're not mad. You, we're not angry. We just want to speak to you. Um, and it's weird because he calls Tom, Thomas Tom the whole time. I don't know if he'd been given permission to do that, but it seems really... The whole message is condescending. And, oh, any speaking to the press will backfire. Trust me, Tom. You know, we've been trying to call you. We don't know why you won't pick up. So, the, there's an eight-hour time difference. He's in the hospital. As you can imagine, communication probably isn't super precise because of those two factors. Well... Megan says that she woke up to read TMZ's report of her father's heart attack and hospitalization. And she would later claim that this was when she time learned of Thomas Markle's condition. What kind of term is time learned? That scenario is hard to believe because both Sarge and the British embassy security guard who'd been sent to Thomas Markle's house were told he was going to the hospital. And Megan had received Thomas's text with the same news. So how is it that she's like, I only learned about my father's condition from a report on TMZ. As you can imagine, it was devastating to find out that way, and that my father hadn't even had the common decency to tell me. All right. Well, now we get into some of the most super passive-aggressive texts you've ever heard in your life, dripping with condescension and clearly denying the reality that her father was in the hospital. Megan texted her father. Um... Because she doubted that this hospitalization was genuine. She thought it was just some dumb lie because he was humiliated about the photos and just didn't want to come out anymore. She says, I've been reaching out to you all weekend, but you're not taking any of our calls or replying to any texts. Very concerned about your health and safety and have taken every measure to protect you, but not sure what more we can do if you don't respond. Do you need help? Can we send the security team down again? I'm very sorry to hear you're in the hospital, but I need you to please get in touch with us. What hospital are you at? So just dripping with condescension, passive aggression. And what is this? Do we need to send the security team down? Okay, you sent one security guard from the British Embassy. Okay, what is the security team? Stop trying to act like you're moving heaven and earth for your dad when you couldn't care less about him. Ten minutes later, Megan fired off another message about security. Harry and I made a decision earlier today, and we are dispatching the same security guys that you turned away this weekend to be a presence on the ground to make sure that you're safe. All of this is incredibly concerning, but your health is most important. Oh, thanks for letting me know that uh, my heart attack matters to you. I mean, if I were Thomas Markle, I would just be like, I would just turn my phone off and be like, whatever, I'm not going to this stupid wedding. They didn't want me anyway, and I need to get well. So uh, this drama is not going to help me heal. And I'm, I'm done with this. Can you imagine the pressure and the tension of all of this going on in the midst of having a heart attack? She's trying to kill him. Then she adds, please, please call as soon as you can. Well, he's in surgery, so you might want to just not hold your breath. 
And it is odd that she would bother to send a security guard to Thomas Markle in Mexico while he's trying to prepare for surgery in California. I mean, why are you sending the security team, which is where she sent it, down to his house? Well, because she didn't think he was really in the hospital. So she sends the security team down to his house and a blatant, you know, middle finger to his story that he was in the hospital. For 18 months, Thomas had been forlornly asking for help. And now when he's not even home, she decides to send a security guard. What in the world? This is beyond anything I could have ever comprehended. In an emergency procedure to prevent a heart attack on, the, on May 16th, two of Markle's arteries were unblocked by angioplasty. Emerging from the anesthetic later, Thomas Markle texted Megan. Surgery went okay, but the heart attack did do some damage. The doctors he continued forbade him to fly that day to London. He wished her the best. Love you and wish that you the best of everything. And then Harry texts this back. Okay, you guys, literally, he just got out of surgery. He literally just said, I love you. I wish I could fly. The doctors have told me I cannot fly out today as planned. This is Harry's response. If you had listened to me, this would never have happened. <laughs> He's as bad as she is. I mean, you know what? Those two deserve each other. Those two deserve each other. The only response, two things are happening here. Either they are just completely hateful and evil people or... They didn't believe that he had really gone to surgery and they thought that this was just some ploy to cover up for his embarrassment over the photos. How could you, how could you think your dad would do that? I mean, what has he ever, what has Thomas Markle ever done in Megan's life that would make him think that she, he would not show up for her if he was at all able to do so? He's never denied her. The only time he's ever not done what she asked was when he... She kept wanting him to go to Toronto and he couldn't afford to do it. But up until that point, he had always done everything and given her everything that she could possibly want. If he was able to do something for her, he was going to do it. Stung by Harry's reprimand and silenced about his health, Thomas considered his position. In a text, he asked Megan, who would give her away? If really required, he texted, I'll come if you really need me. I'm sorry about this. But then TMZ reported, and that after all, Thomas had decided to fly to Britain. So I don't know where they got that tidbit unless Thomas had called and said, oh, I think I will go. I don't know how he thought he was going to make it to the wedding on time. And also his doctors had said, don't fly. He just had heart surgery. Are you kidding me right now? How in the world did he really think he could go? He needs to stop worrying about what these two clowns think. And just he needs to go live his life. From London, Harry sent texts saying that they were not angry. Uh, it seems like you might be, though, has with this. If you'd listened to me, this would never have happened. I mean, I'm not angry or anything, but you're a buffoon. Then Megan telephoned Thomas, and she pleaded that he come to London. And hearing her cry, Thomas became convinced that his daughter did not believe that he was in the hospital. The call ended acrimoniously. Maybe it would be better for you guys if I were dead, snapped Thomas and hung up. Oh. But can we blame him for feeling this way? What have they shown thus far that would prove that they valued his life at all. Harry fired off what Thomas regarded as three telling off texts. First, Harry admonished Thomas for talking to the press and accused him of hurting Megan. You guys, we're going to see Harry acting like they're 16 years old and his dad just told her she can't have a late curfew. I mean, he's so bratty to Thomas and so like, if you really loved your daughter, you'd let her have some of the things that she wants. Harry admonished Thomas for talking to the press and accused him of hurting Megan. To Thomas's distress, Harry did not ask him about his health or the operation or send him good wishes. Deeply wounded, Thomas sent a curt reply. I've done nothing to hurt you, Megan, or anyone else. I'm sorry my heart attack is any inconvenience for you. Harry would deny that the exchange occurred. Megan, however, acknowledged she had received an unpleasant message from her father. Of course, she's not going to miss an opportunity to be victimized by her dad that nothing makes her happier than to be able to paint the wounded image within five minutes she called him four times and he didn't answer well good for him using megan's phone harry texted tom it's harry please answer your phone i need to know this is actually you because it doesn't sound like you at all 
Harry, you can just see these two, like, hold up in some back room somewhere, angrily discussing the situation with each other, planning their next move, talking about how terrible Thomas is, you know, whipping each other up into an emotional fury. I mean, what is this? It doesn't really sound like my dad at all. Is there some kind of coup going on? What's happening? Who's taking over my dad's life? I don't know, but it's really crazy. I, I'm, I'm getting really worried. I, I think he's, he's working with some kind of an operator. You know, Give me a phone. I'll text him this time. If he's not answering you, he's got to by God answer me. Thomas later explained, There is a time and a place to say what he said to me, but not when I was in the hospital, lying there after a heart attack. Thereafter, Megan never sent another text to Thomas, never telephoned him, and ignored his calls forever. This is so beyond selfish, it needs a new name. How can your father be lying in a hospital bed, recovering from surgery and heart attacks, and you want to get all upset and all frothy with rage because he can't make it to the wedding? The wedding that you didn't really want him to come to anyway. None of the things that you did made him feel like he was a welcome guest. So now she gets to put on this great big pretend that my dad abandoned me on my most important day. And I can't talk to somebody like that who has no regard for my feelings and my emotions and the things that matter to me. He's a toxic person. He's a toxic person who wouldn't show up for my wedding and who made up crazy stories and he tried to... Use a relationship to make money. Me and my daddy were always really close. And now, well, he's toxic. And I'm seeing that now. And I'm being honest about that now. And I'm taking steps in my healing process after this really devastating relationship to just move on and heal. I have to heal. Lord Jesus. Oh my goodness. Well, on 16th of May, three days before the wedding, Kensington Palace's official spokesperson briefed that Thomas would not be coming to Britain because of ill health. Okay, so the truth is finally coming out about why he can't be there. It's not because he took some embarrassing photos. And you guys, I mean, well, I guess I'll talk about that at the end. Well, Thomas is not going to be able to make it. But several members of the Markle family have arrived in London to appear live on TV. (laughs) And you guys, when I tell you this is a motley crew that showed up. Okay, listen to who showed up, all right? None of the usual players managed to make it. Characterized as alcoholics, cannabis growers, and jailbirds lured by money, they were angry not to be invited to the family reunion. The visitors included Rosalind, Thomas Markle's first wife, and Tom Jr.'s ex-wife, And her two sons. And none of them had ever even met Megan. (laughs) And the ex-wife brought her two sons named Tyler and Dooley. (laughs) Well, Megan's nephew Tyler used his visit to promote his latest cannabis product, Markle's Sparkle. And Tyler, who was estranged from his father, made the... made. Efforts to let everyone know that his dad, Tom Jr., was just a vile human being. Meanwhile, Dooley over there is trying to do better. Dooley praised Megan, and he denounced the media's reporting. He said that he'd always admired her. Okay, but not surprisingly, at the last moment, all the Markles were dropped by the broadcasters. Yet, who would not be silenced? Samantha Markle. She wanted to promote her forthcoming book, The Diary of Princess Pushy's Sister and denounce the descriptions of Megan as a compassionate humanitarian. You guys, nobody's going to say Samantha can't have her feelings about it, but, like, let it go, sister. You know, I mean, is this really what you want to be known for? The bitter half-sister who won't let it go? The Diary of Princess Pushy's Sister, that sounds like a really terrible children's book with those horrific illustrations done by a computer. I mean, what is this? Like, at a certain point, Go live your own life. Megan, she said, had nothing in common with Diana. Early in the year, she told US TV, we were asked not to speak to the public. But I'm pretty adamant about it. There's something in this country called freedom of speech. And she doesn't have a copyright on that. Yeah, she doesn't. You're right. You can say whatever you want. You can say whatever. 
But should you? I just wish somebody would have helped her with the title of that book. The Diary of Princess Pushy's Sister. People are making money off of Samantha's disappointment in life. And unfortunately, she's also monetizing her disappointment. But I just don't think it makes her look good. The Diary of Princess Pushy's Sister. I just can't get over how lame that title is. It just is so petty. Like, If I was related to Megan, I can imagine coming out at some point and saying, you all are being fed some lies. Like if I said anything at all, it would be one time and then I'd dry up on the subject. Because if this person is so terrible, I don't want to tether even one more moment of my life to this person's life. All right, well, Samantha's over there promoting her book. We've got Tyler and Dooley in their weed. It's just an absolute circus. I mean, an absolute circus. Amid that background noise, Megan's dilemma was who would walk her down the chapel aisle. Harry agreed to ask Charles. He's our father after all, and so of course he's going to be there for us. And Charles said that he'd do whatever Megan needed and that he was there to support them. Then later, Harry says this little jab. He was there for us. He was the one out of the two left to deal. He tried to do his best and to make sure that we were protected and looked after. So now suddenly he can speak kindly about his father. Harry is such... He's about as two-faced as she is. When it is convenient for him, he'll speak kindly about a family member. But then he'll just suddenly jab at a person. We saw that over and over and over in Spare. That was like a hallmark of the book. He would say kind things, kind things, kind things, and then like from nowhere, he'd come at you with a knife in the kidneys. It's like, what is wrong with this person? Thomas Markle could not be airbrushed from the ceremony, try as they might. His name was printed on the order of service. To square the circle, the palace needed to secure his approval of the arrangement. To conceal the family crisis... James Beale of the Sun was falsely told by palace sources that Megan had spoken to her father, and she'd said that she loved him, he had recounted that he was recovering well and not to worry, and apparently Thomas had told Megan that he was honored that Charles would give her away. What dad would be honored by that? What a blow. Charles can't give her away. What is even the point? I mean, she should have just walked down alone instead of having this, like, how does how does one dad give the child away to the other child? I mean, that just looks stupid. You know, this would have been the time to call up one of those uncles that she had not invited and said, please, please, please come. Because that just looks, I mean, fundamentally, that's just weird. Unseen during the furor was Doria Raglan, who'd quietly arrived in London on the 17th of May. Escorted from the plane as a VIP, she was driven directly to Cliveden House Hotel outside of London to prepare to meet Charles and the Queen at Clarence House in Windsor. Megan had successfully suppressed the truth about her mother. And Tom Bower gives us this little gem. In turn, Doria was ordered not to say a word, and that appeared to include not making the slightest facial expression. <laughs> it's true, though. Because every picture you see, she's like frozen. <laughs> <laughs> Seriously, she looks tranquilized. Doria was about to participate in one of Windsor's greatest theatrical performances, and some would say a hapless royal family hijacked by Hollywood. Yeah, some might. I wouldn't. I mean, I feel like they had been given ample opportunity to see what sort of person she was. Look, I know that they wanted to give in to Harry constantly and continually. Like there was going to be some kind of prize money in it by giving him his way but I think that to say that they were victim, to say they were victims of Megan's mania, I think is to give them too easy of, of a pass. Megan was terrible, but they could have made life harder for her by not giving her everything she wanted. She stayed because she thought she had control over these people. Had they held the line and not let her have every single little thing and not bent over backwards and and not capitulated to all of her demands and had refused to let her talk to them like that and had not just given their little quiet polite smiles but developed new weapons against this new enemy they may have been able to drive her away before it ever came to this why they felt the need to rush things like this i mean i would have been like where's the pregnancy test 
You cannot just tell me that you're pregnant as a, as a way to speed things up or whatever the reason was. I mean, it just seems like they should have had some royal physicians, you know, attend to her so that they could decide if that were true or not. And there's just so many things that they could have done differently that I don't, I don't agree that they were hijacked by Hollywood. If they wanted to have driven her away, they could have done it. And I just don't know if they had complete unity on the idea of like, let's collectively show her that this is not her place. I, I think if, if she's this evil and she's this manipulative and she's this hateful, they would have been doing Harry a favor to let her know what it was really going to be like. There's all sorts of traditions and customs that she was bowling right over. So how is she being given a true, honest picture of what royal life was really going to be like? They were doing her an ultimate disservice. Sure, they're giving her her way now, but were they prepared to give her her way always? If they weren't, then this should have been over. This should have been ended. And they should have let her know from the get-go this is the way we play. If you want to play this way, play this way. Otherwise, there's the door. All right. Well, let's just have a little recap real quick, though, about, you know, this whole chapter has been about those pictures. Can we just collectively agree that it doesn't even make sense why those pictures were that big of a deal? I don't get it. I truly do not understand. I mean, yeah, they were super cheesy and lame. I mean, the one where he's getting fitted by the tailor... And he looks like he's, you know, hanging out at Joanne Fabrics. What in the world? Like, is he going to have his morning suit made out of violet lace and polka dotted felt? I mean, what is this? He had been to a tailor before. So it stands to reason that he understood the way this was supposed to look. So why did he agree to this? And then, you know, there's shots of him out on some backcountry road with a you know a couple of two pound weights in his hands you know walking around and and then these ones of him looking through guidebooks and scrolling I mean he doesn't have a computer at his house why is he at an internet cafe is it 1997 I mean what is going on in any of these pictures like none of these pictures made any sense so just on that level it's super lame but were they hurting anyone? That's, I mean, Megan, for Megan to cry and cry and cry and say, my dad, he betrayed me. Your dad didn't betray you. And I mean, you know, of course, there's all the stories about the fact that she is good friends with this photographer. And it stands to reason that she set her own dad up so she could be this victim to everything. And you guys, if Harry had any idea about any of this, I tend to think he didn't. Because I think that it's so diabolical that she probably just did it on her own and lied to him the whole way too. I mean, if you ask me, Harry has no idea what's going on about most things. I mean, she's playing, she's played him this whole time. There has never been a time when she was genuine with him. So for her to have this whole scheme and plan going, she's not going to invite him into this, into the planning now. Then he's going to know what kind of a person she really is. So I think that this was a plan that she did on her own and then would cry and throw herself into Harry's arms and, you know, let him be her savior. Because you see him repeatedly trying to be her savior to her dad, being like, if you really loved Megan, if you, if you really cared about your daughter at all, you know, all this. So and this whole chapter was just really sickening to me because it just was so clear that Megan was being manipulative. And even if it had all been exactly as Megan was watching it play out and she had no hand in it whatsoever, her response was cruel. And Harry's response was cruel. And if my fiance spoke to my dad like that, I would be like, here's the ring, I'm going home. And I'm legitimately serious about that. If my dad was on his death, if my dad was on his potential deathbed trying to recover from heart surgery and my fiance took that opportunity to grind his face in his mistake, I would just be like, okay, thank you for letting me know how you really are. Goodbye. How could they not believe that he was really in the hospital? Megan could have found that out so easily. Like with one phone call, she could have known where he was. There's people in place to help her figure out where her dad is. If there was any real concern. 
She did not want to know what the facts were so she can continue to sit over there and marinate in her sorrow that her dad had abandoned her. You know, and of course she knows he didn't. But for her to like go around to everybody and, and tell her pathetic little sob story, it's like, girl, get it together. What are you like, almost 40 years old? You know, I think you can manage. And why aren't you more worried about your dad? I think that that's the thing that would have shocked me as a member of the royal family. I would have thought, why is this girl not more worried about her own father? Do we want this kind of person who seems to have no understanding about familial bond and, and care and, and concern and empathy for her sick father? All she cares about is the fact that he's not coming. Megan, you had set him up to come so close to the wedding that any number of things could have happened and could have delayed him from coming because you weren't allowing him to get to, into the city with enough time. And that whole BS about the driver showing up randomly. There is just so many questions. I have so many questions about the story. And it just reeks of some kind of con going on. I totally think that Megan set him up. I mean, there's not even a doubt in my mind. Tom Bauer doesn't say that. And I'm reviewing the book that Tom Bauer wrote. But I think we can all come to the conclusion that Megan set her dad up so she could be the victim, so she wouldn't have to have him at the wedding, and so that she could just stop people asking her anything about him. So she could just say, well, you can see what sort of person he is. So I don't want him around because so, he's going to interfere. He's going to make things worse for the royal family. You can see what a money-grubbing whore he is. <laughs> I can't have him around. All right, well, that's the end of that. The next chapter that we get to is about the wedding. So I'm excited to hear about the fiasco that was truly going on behind the scenes. I'll see you guys later. Bye.